I was just speaking about subnet masks and why you have to subnet the network. And if you've had to calculate these things before or figure out what your IP address is, what your subnet mask is, what your default gateway is, you notice whenever you're configuring IP on a machine, TCP IP a protocol on a machine, you need to at least know those three things, which is your IP address, your subnet mask, and your default gateway. Well, why do you need a subnet mask? Can I just type in the address and I'm done? Well, the problem is that, of course, is that our networks are not all in one place. You might have a network in one location. You've got switches that connect to routers that go across the internet to yet another set of routers, where on the other side, we now have a completely different group of IP addresses. The way that our routers are able to send traffic through the internet is they know where all these different subnets are. So if we send traffic to Google, Google, we're figuring out the IP address of Google. We send it off to our router and say, please get this to Google in whatever way possible. And the routers know, oh, the subnet for Google is located that away, and off the pack it goes. You may actually step through eight, nine, 10 different routers or more to finally get to the endpoint. And then it has to hop through all of those routers to come back to where you are. This magic of routing in between could only happen if we had some way to tell our local systems we are not on the Google subnet. The Google subnet is out there somewhere. Go find Google, and off it goes. And that's the beauty of subnetting is that we can define what our local world is, and our routers know if it ever needs to get anywhere else, it goes that way. And it's the subnet mask that does that for us. So if we think about this idea of subnetting the network up into smaller pieces, we do need to know an IP address. So your computer has an IP address on it. Your mobile phone has an IP address on it. Uh, your printer might have an IP address on it. Anything that communicates on the network via TCP IP must have an IP address. So we're going to give one to every device that's out there. Usually you don't do this manually. It's done automatically from your DHCP server or the router that you have in your house. So the IP address and the subnet mask are things that are normally just put on your computer by default. The subnet mask, as we mentioned, tells your computer what subnet you happen to be on. You don't usually see this at all transmitted over the network. This is really something that your local computer uses to calculate who you are relative to everybody else in the world. And so it knows that if you're 192.168.1.165 with this subnet mask, there's only a certain number of machines that you can communicate without having to go out to your default gateway. And that's the third most important piece here is that we need to know what is the default gateway on your network so that if your computer realizes, wow, I need to talk to Google, it's on a completely different subnet. To do that, I need to go talk to my router and tell my router to send this packet on its way. Your computer knows where that router is located. And so those are your magical three pieces of information at a bare minimum that you'll need to get a computer up and running and be able to communicate outside of your subnet is your IP address, your subnet mask, and your default gateway. When you start looking at your IP address, one of the things that you'll notice is that the IP address itself, it really isn't a single address. It's a set of four numbers we put together. But part of those numbers refer to the network that I happen to be on, and that's my subnet. And the other set section of the IP address happens to be a node or a single device number that I happen to have on that subnet. What we've done in creating that IP address is put both of those things together and put them into one number. And it's somewhat complicated to understand at the very first when you start using IP addresses. But as you start becoming more accustomed to looking at the IP address and the subnet mask, it becomes a little bit easier for you to break out what is the network part of this address and what is the node part of this address or the host part of this address. These are really important things. So if you mess up your subnet mask, it could have a dramatic impact on how you're able to communicate out to other devices on the network. So make sure when you're configuring these things that you have your IP address properly set and your subnet mask set properly, or else you're gonna, you may have some communication problems there. When we were first building the internet, we had to separate our networks out in certain ways. So we came up with these ways to separate out the networks into these very, very specific classes, these specific groups of subnets. We really haven't used this class-based subnetting since 1993. We've really extended the way that we can subnet our networks into much more granular pieces. But these terms will still apply in casual conversation. For instance, if your network is subnetted with a 255.0.0.0 subnet, 
subnet mask, then we say that is a class A subnet. A class B subnet would be 255.255.0.0, and a class C subnet would be 255.255.255.0. So we see this all the time. In fact, if we go back and look at the way my machine was configured, we saw that I had a 192.168.0.8 as my IP address, and my subnet mask was 255.255.255.0. So if I was speaking to someone in casual conversation, I would say, oh, I've got this IP address and I'm running a class C subnet. On the other end of the phone or the person I'm talking to will already know, oh, a class C subnet, then I know your subnet mask must be 255, 255, 255, 0. And they'll configure their systems that way. It's just a shortcut that we use today to talk about the way these subnet masks work. And it's a way that in casual conversation, we can really describe the way our network is configured. Not only did we define subnet masks to be a class A, B, and C, and you can see the default subnet mask for class A. We've just rewritten them right here in this last column. But we also said that if the first number that is in your IP address is between 1 and 126, that's a class A network that's using that class A sub default subnet mask. If your first number of your IP address is between 128 and 191, that's a class B. So network with a class B subnet mask set to it. And if the first number is 192 to 223, it's class C. And you've also got class D and class E here, which are multicast. You don't see that much unless it is an environment where it's a multicast network, or it's a class E network, which was never really defined or, or really used for anything else. It is a reserved set of numbers. So you'll most often see a class A, a class B, and a class C. For the purposes of your A plus certification, you will want to memorize what those leading numbers are in that address. If that starts with 1 to 126, class A, class B, and class C, just remember what those are. Now, if you did the math, it would turn out a class A network had a, a maximum number of 128 networks. And on each one of those networks, I could have over 16 million devices. Don't really see class A networks. That's a lot of devices on a single network. Class B networks could have 16 over 16,000 networks and over 65,000 hosts per network. And on my network right here that we're using right now is a class C network. If I wanted to, I could have 2 million networks here in my house. That would be nice, wouldn't it? And I have 254 hosts that I could have on a single network. How this is defined on your environment at home is, is usually created inside of your router. And in most cases, it's a class C. If you go to a large environment, a large enterprise, you may find the IP address and the subnet masking used in your environment is very different than this. And that's very common. If you're someone who's designing IP networks, you want to have a lot of flexibility. And some networks may be subnetted in different ways. That's the way we really get this whole idea of getting a packet from where I am to Google and back and have it go in the fastest possible way is using the subnetting and using it in an efficient way so that it works very, very fast. But we need more to get the traffic between us and Google. There's a few extra things that have to happen along the way. So we're going to need some extra different IP configuration settings to make that happen.